Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Richmond Times Dispatch Public Square, where a most unusual event will happen tonight. It will be the RVA debut of the Wire Richmond study, also an unprecedented delivery of a body of work that should motivate our region to answer this question, will they stay or will they go? How many people have been to the public square before? Okay, how many people have not? How many people missed that question? Oh, so just tease. Very good, good audience. The public square is, uh, is uh, started in 2005. It's our civil out in five. And this one is special to us because we're leaning into a conversation about the future. Uh, basically, it's a presentation of a very special study and a conversation with those who put it together. And more importantly, the first reaction of the employers who answered, where are those jobs coming from? Let me do something first. I have, I've not done this in a while, but I want to make sure that there's a condition for the uh, public square, and that's uh, you need to know who's around you. So we're going to take two minutes. Just look around you and see if there's somebody you don't know and introduce yourself. That's part of the civil conversation. Oh, people are actually sitting next to each other and don't know each other. <laughs> Just take two minutes. Oh, hey, I'm all for three. I'm Trey. Good to see you. I was at the Venture Richmond there. Good to see you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, all right, folks. I knew I'd lose the audience. I knew I'd lose it. Okay, that's the two minutes up. Obviously, you're a, uh, you're a group of multi-taxers. I've never seen so many people introduce themselves just sitting and not getting up. So uh, it's sort of a, an acquired taste here. So let me tell you what's going to happen tonight, and we'll turn it over to the group behind this. So tonight's topic is attracting RVA's next generation. What can our region do to remain a contender? We've got three parts. The public square starts at 7. It ends at 8.30. Um, and our three parts kind of fit nicely in 30-minute segments, two of which have an opportunity for the audience to engage. Part one is a presentation about the Why RVA series and a series of conclusions from the young professional generation about the Richmond region. Uh, this public square is the first airing of the study sponsored by Richmond's Future, a think tank created by VCU President Emeritus Gene Trani, who's over here. Would you stand, Dr. Trani? And thank you very much. Give him a round of applause. Thank you for being here. Good. We have to give credit where credit's due. We're, we're using that study for tonight's program. Thank you for being here. Uh, part two will be a question and answer with the young professionals who helped shape the survey and also help raise up the conclusions. And then part three, we'll bring the employers, a selection of employers, small, medium, and large, to get the first reaction as to what they think the study means to them, particularly in the case of jobs. That's all my moderating tonight. I'll be back with a microphone to make sure the audience. Let me turn it over to my colleague, Michael Phillips, who, unbeknownst to me, played a key role in this, which is no sneaky thing in millenniums. I'm going to a meeting, all of a sudden, there's Michael, is that my, Michael Phillips, the sports writer? Why aren't you at UVA covering a game? <laughs> no, I got more important things. I'm here, here trying to make Richmond a better region. So on behalf of the Times Dispatch, I'm real proud that you're part of this. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to you, because as a boomer, I need to leave. <laughs> Well, we're going to present to you guys, and then afterward, we're going to have a little question and answer. There's only one microphone, but a lot of you have cell phones, I'm assuming, because we have a younger crowd tonight. So if you do want to join us on Twitter throughout the program, we have a hashtag. It's RVA Next. I'm going to tweet right now to kick this thing off. And you all can jump on your phones, do it while we're presenting. We're young people. We won't be offended. <laughs> Rachel Burgess is going to get us started. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. My name is Rachel Burgess. I'm VP at the Southeastern Institute of Research, SIR. And Richmond's Future, when they decided to ask this question, reached out to us to conduct the studies behind this. So before we get into the findings and recommendations, we need to understand why is this even a question? Why do we need to attract and retain young professionals? 
And that's what Richmond's future set out to do. Well, first, who are the young professionals? Uh, this slide shows a generational breakdown, and most of the young professionals fit into the Gen X and Millennial category. Um, so it's usually uh, age range between 22 and 40. Um, in our survey, we made that a little bit self-selective, but that's what we focused in on. And millennials are those born between 1983 and 2001. So this is the generation that we really are focusing on because they're the future of the young professional workforce. But the thing is, there's a coming war over attracting and retaining young professionals. In December, there is a large article in USA Today talking about this issue. We recently read an article uh, out of Canada that was talking about it and how can their cities better attract and retain young professionals. And the reason for this is that there's an uh, upcoming jobs war. And we know this because we're taking a look at America's age shift. And at SIR, we do a lot of uh, trends research, and we, we see this coming. And the reason why is if you look at life expectancy, so in 1900, the life expectancy was about 47. In 2010, it was 80. So that's about a doubling of the life expectancy. At the same time, we're seeing a reduction in birth rates. And this started in the 60s with the introduction of the birth control pill. And so we, we're seeing people living longer and fewer babies being born. And so what we know is the traditional age pyramid where there's more younger people, more youth and young adult, and uh, fewer old people, it's changing. And if we look at this, um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, and we're going to see this over time. And we're seeing that people are living longer. And as we go into the future, in 2041, you can see that it's not really a pyramid anymore. It's a rectangle. And so we have to completely change the way that we think about this pyramid and think of it more as like an empire state building, where there's about as many people at youth and young adult as there are at old age. And so this really is going to change everything, and this means that there's going to be a coming job shortage. So another way to look at this is if we look at the demographic of those aged 55 plus, that's going to grow in the next 15 years by 25 million. The demographic aged between 20 and 54 is only going to grow by 12 million. And that is a very big gap. So you're going to see all of these people living longer. They're going to be leaving the workforce, and there's not going to be enough people coming in. So there's going to be a fight over the young people. And at the same time, we're seeing a shift in where people are living. They're moving from rural communities into urban environments. And so again, this is a big deal for cities because they're going to be fighting over these young professionals because they don't want their city to have a jobs war. And so Richmond is going to be a part of this fight, and how do we not be one of the losing cities in this? And that is why Richmond's future has asked this question. And so he came to SIR, and we created the YRBA study. And uh, here's a picture of our project team. And in our studies, we did um, a bunch of different studies. We uh, had over 3,500 people participate uh, in several surveys. We asked over 100 questions, uh, gained about 350,000 plus data points. Uh, and we have over 500 pages in multiple reports. So if you have any in-depth questions, we can answer that for you. Uh, we, we won't go into that detail tonight. Uh, the different audiences that we study, we study college students across Virginia, focusing on those in Richmond, but then also um, outside of Richmond, but in Virginia. We looked at young professionals in peer cities, uh, and then young professionals in Richmond. Uh, we also interviewed uh, in collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce, business leaders, and then we did some focus groups with HR leaders. Today we're going to focus on these three audiences, uh, and the project teams are going to take you through that. Uh, and so what we decided... We could have done a traditional SIR uh, study, but we decided we really wanted this to be engaging, exciting, and meaningful and lasting. And so to do that, we invited actual young professionals to help us uh, with this project. And so we invited uh, the people that you're going to get to meet tonight, and they actually helped us craft the questionnaires. They helped disseminate the surveys. They helped us analyze the data, and then they put together the reports that you're about to see. I mean, it's been really exciting, and it's great to have this information coming from their mouths, and they've developed the recommendations themselves. Um, so we're really excited about them. Uh, and I won't go through their names right now. They'll introduce themselves as they come up. Um, but they also represent 10 different companies, and we want to thank those companies uh, for letting us have these, the time of these young professionals because we know that they're busy. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass it off to Colden Martin, who's going to walk us through the college presentation. Hey everybody, how's everyone doing? Cool. Um, as you can see, not by their outfits, but rather by the looks of a sheer terror 
and panic and uncertainty on these young minds faces I'm obviously part of the college and universities part of the study um, and I wanted to share a few insights with you guys and uh, just kind of like our generation I'm gonna move pretty fast so uh, if you're going to have any questions or anything, I'm sure we'll be able to answer them later on. So ultimately, uh, when we kind of took a look at the data, it really came down to kind of two major findings. It, these are sort of the uh, farm-raised meat and all organic potatoes of the survey as far as we're concerned. And that is really um, about uh, our biggest asset, which is our sense of culture and the kind of creative atmosphere that we're breeding here in Richmond. But we also want to kind of look at our biggest attractor, which we feel uh, is jobs and job choices. Before we get into this, I kind of want to just uh, go over the demographics very quickly, just who responded. Um, in our group, uh, we took a look at 589 uh, different surveys that were turned in from people in schools in the Richmond area, uh, like VSU, VCU, VU, U of R, JSARGE. But we also took a lot of uh, data from people in schools elsewhere in the state. And uh, these skewed um, a little bit female, um, but ultimately I don't want to have you guys swimming in a sea of data as we uh, just start. So let's talk uh, for a second about this sense of culture and uh, if I can figure out how Prezi works, our uh, creative atmosphere. How many of you guys saw this, uh, the Grid Magazine article? This came out last month, and um, I think it really encapsulates what I would like to kind of call a cultural renaissance that's happening here in Richmond. Um, it only takes a few seconds of walking outside to see that right now, Richmond is an incredibly exciting place to be. Um, there are countless ways that people are expressing their sense of creativity and innovation. And uh, there's no better embodiment, of course, than uh, the recent TED Talks. Uh, does anyone know the uh, theme of TEDxRVA? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, bottom line, we're engaged in a much larger discussion right now about all these creative endeavors that people are doing. I mean, you take a look at this list right here, and I mean, you've got Richmond Restaurant Week covering the food scene. You've got these food carts. You've got these great publications like Style, RVA Magazine, and the RTD that are covering these sort of things. And it's really quite obvious that Richmond is a town right now that is wearing their creativity on their sleeve. And is this enough to bring people here for college? Yeah, I really, really think it is. Richmond is a great place to come for school. And when we took a look at the data, we saw that 78% of people in our town that are going to school here absolutely love it here. And why they love it? They gave us the reasons. Number one is food. And this doesn't just mean incredible wealth of food options, but rather sort of the scene that it cultivates. And another group's going to talk about that later on. They have the socializing. You have the nightlife and the bars, shows to go to every night of the week. And then you've got these great community events. You've got the Folk Festival. You've got Dominion River Rock. Some incredible things that happen all the time that really allow the community to come together. The bottom line is, though, we sort of, when we looked at the data, were wondering why isn't this enough to keep people here? We saw that 41% of college students that are currently here only see themselves staying here for one to two years after graduation before they potentially want to go move on and explore other markets. And then for students elsewhere in the state, we saw that only 43% of them are saying that they're not even likely to consider moving here. And we understand that these aren't exactly bad numbers, but we certainly think that there's room for improvement. And uh, when we were wondering what exactly was, was either keeping them away or making them start considering other options, it really came down to shifting priorities. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was in school, um, it was kind of like a light switch. Uh, when I was sitting there in the Siegel Center waiting to graduate, um, my priorities kind of went from figuring out exactly how many shows I could go to in one night uh, to how exactly like I'm going to pay for things like electricity and like food and basic things. And so really when we, looked at, uh, when we looked at the data, we saw that without a doubt, without a doubt, the number one things on people's mind when they graduate are jobs. And that's really not that surprising of a notion, to be honest. You know, we all are going to want to, to have a job after graduate. It's the point of going to school. But what was really interesting was the types of jobs that people wanted. 
we saw that 87% of students here and 76% of students elsewhere in the state are hungry for jobs that encourage creating new ideas and creating new content. Meaning that people our age aren't exactly content to just sort of join the workforce and start uh, pushing paper, as they say. Instead, they really want to take our sort of personality-driven approach that we take to everything that we do in life and apply it to the workplace. Now, this is a sort of scary notion, you know, because not every business can really support, you know, like a team of, uh, like, freestyle poets or, you know, incredible uh, acoustic guitar players at the workforce. But what we really kind of saw was that creativity didn't necessarily have to mean art in the traditional sense of the word. It actually is more about a certain spirit, a certain sense of, of, of innovating new and creative systems that can be applied to things that weren't traditionally thought as creative. Now, going back to this uh, grid cover, and I promise I don't work for them. I just really thought this was an awesome cover. Um, you know, we're seeing here RVA brewers, carpenters, designers, hackers, inventors, bakers. You know, these are, these are things that are becoming incredibly sought after uh, Every weekend here in RVA, people are going to Hardywood. Uh, people are buying uh, really nice shirts. Uh, and there's, there's so many options in front of us. But the thing is, this spirit, not everyone is going to be a craft brewer, bottom line, because I've tried. And it just doesn't work out as well. Um, and we can't get the smell out of the garage. But, uh, but really, the same idea that causes people to start these incredible startups, these incredible nonprofits, these incredible artistic endeavors, is really something that we all hold to our hearts. The idea that we can bring something new to the table. And so I've got a couple suggestions that our group came up with. And we thought these were going to be sort of tailored to mainly um, the CEO crowd and some of the people sitting at really intimidatingly large board tables. But um, the bottom line is I think you all should hear these things too. On the university level, we saw when we took a look at the data that um, a lot of people felt that their schools actually were doing a pretty decent job of connecting them to the community. But we think that this could be taken an even uh, a step further. And so we feel that uh, the colleges and universities around here are really uh, have an incredible resource at their disposal when people are sitting there waiting to graduate. We feel that exit surveys that really not only talk about uh, people's academic experience at a school, but really talks about how the school connected them to the community, connected them to the world around them, is going to be incredibly valuable data to furthering studies like these and to further getting insight from our region. So it may seem like something very simple, but we feel that when people are ready to graduate, they're ready to talk. And that data can be incredibly valuable for not only the universities, but the em employers in the area. The other thing is providing a foot in the door. I don't know about uh, anyone else here, but I knew when I was graduating, all I could really think about was like, who do I know? How do I take advantage of some connection that I've neglected over the past few years? What am I going to do? And we really think that on the college and university level, helping to provide a foot in the door can be an absolutely invaluable thing. Uh, VCU does an incredible job of this with uh, the Create-a-thon which is this huge event for creative uh, advertising students that allows them to do real work for local nonprofits and small businesses that they can then actually use. And as, as much as this is an exercise for them to kind of stretch their creative muscles, it really allows them to make real connections and really meet people in the actual community they want to be a part of. And so uh, helping to provide the foot in the door on the university level is going to be an absolutely vital step in connecting uh, young people with the community around them. Along similar lines, foster familiarity. You know, when you're in school, you kind of have a tendency to want to think of your campus sometimes as sort of like a bubble, you know, sort of a place that uh, is this sort of self-contained, like, pleasure dome where you can do anything you want. But the bottom line is, is those schools are often um, in a much larger community like Richmond. And anything that the school can do to really... Um, to really showcase the community around them, offering tours, offering videos that kind of uh, illustrate how many chances they have to participate in the community when they graduate or even while they're in school is going to be absolutely vital. 
And then the bottom line, uh, to kind of bring it back to this whole sort of cultural value of RVA right now, we really need to, uh, from the corporate level, start thinking about how we're advertising our jobs. You know, like I said, you know, jobs aren't traditionally thought of as creative endeavors. They're thought as practical ways that you can kind of go and spend your days and earn your money and, and kind of go on. But our generation isn't really down to settle for that. You know, we want to do something active. And so we think it's really just a matter of language. When you're looking for people, think about what are they going to be looking for? They're going to be looking to create. They're going to be looking to innovate. And so sometimes it's really just a matter of language when it comes to recruitment. Start appealing to this sense of community and this cultural drive. And I think that you'll be shocked to see that people that might not have even considered the company uh, will actually really uh, be quite eager to bring what they can to the table. So in conclusion, in terms of keeping people here and kind of that uh, retention that we're desperately trying to achieve, we think that we can keep college grads here for the same reason that they came here. And it's really just about fostering that sense of communal pride, you know, tapping into that creative spirit. And we really think everything's going to work out. So um, I'm going to uh, move on now. It was great talking with you all. Hi, my name is Patrice Lewis, and if you didn't see the Richmond Times Dispatch this morning, I am Outreach Representative for Senator Mark Warner's office. I was on the front page, and that's why I said that. Um, and along with uh, Michael and Andrew, we represent the group that looked at six cities around uh, the United States that we consider our peers. And as soon as this comes up, we'll show you which ones they are. Not our slide, it's okay. Okay, um, and the cities are Washington, D.C., Austin, Texas, um, Denver, Colorado, uh, Raleigh, and Charlotte, North Carolina. Did I forget one? Okay, great, thank you. I'm trying to do this by memory. And the one thing that we said the, that sums up what young professionals from other cities, peer cities, think of when they think of uh, Richmond is the word nothing. They really didn't have anything negative to say about Richmond. They weren't hating on Richmond, but they weren't in love with Richmond. Um, they really didn't know much about Richmond. So we said that Richmond is really, here it goes. Yes. So we said that really they said nothing, and that means that Richmond is the nice guy. And you know how they say that nice guys finish last? Well, that's another way of saying that nice guys don't really get much play because they're not really in the game. Um, I consider myself a Texas girl born and raised in Virginia, and I never lived there. But I'm the only one in my immediate family who was not born in Texas. And if you know anything about Texans, then you know for us the world revolves around Texas. It's considered the center of the universe to us instead of Ashland. Forget Ashland. Um, and we live and breathe it, and it trickles down generations. In fact, um, I'm proud to say here at the Times-Dispatch, where we're talking all about uh, the Redskins, that my nephews who are born here in, Char in Chesterfield are Cowboys fans, and we're actually very proud of that uh, fact. Um, but I digress. It's really a great thing, even though it seems like it's a lot of boasting and a lot of pride. It actually works. In fact, when we looked at how does your community stack up in several different areas, and of all of the cities, Austin, Texas had high marks for each and every, every category. And it was about 13, I believe. They love their city. And the thing is, is that Richmond, Virginia young professionals aren't that far behind. They're at 86% and we're at 78%. The problem is we don't really talk about what we have. We don't really Texas, we don't have that Texas swagger. We don't really boast about what we have. So familiarity is pretty low. When we looked at familiarity, DC, Charlotte, and Raleigh are the top. And we don't even break 25%. And these are places 
that border Virginia and Richmond is the capital. To further put this in perspective, we looked at how Richmond, Virginia young professionals know or what they know about what Richmond has to offer. And we cross-sectioned it with what Pierce City's young professionals know that Richmond has to offer. And we calculated pretty much the gap in between. So this represents the percentage of people that don't know what Richmond has to offer. And just for the sake of time, we're going to go over some of the big ones, food, arts, access to water, history, education, we're at 50, 60% that don't know that Richmond has these great things. Now when familiarity is put in there, we get a little bit lower to 20, 30%. And this is what we have to work on. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Michael who's gonna give us a little bit more on what we can do. Thanks, I'll give a little less swagger though. Got one of these guys, cool tonight. All right, um, yeah, just to emphasize something Patrice said, you, Washington, D.C., it's an hour and a half from here. You can drive up there. You can take the bus up there. You can take the train up there. There's a lot of options to get to Washington, D.C., and yet in Washington, D.C., three out of every four young people said, "Now nah, we've never been to Richmond. We don't know anything about Richmond. So, yes, we want these people to move here. We want to employ them here, but let's get them in the door first. What's going to get these people into Richmond? So let's start with what's not working. Here's what's not working. You know all these ad campaigns, historic Richmond, the Civil War, the Robert E. Lee statue, et cetera. They're not working. Um, you know, that's not to say young people don't like history. It's not to say young people don't connect with history. That's just to say it's not motivating them to come into Richmond. The second thing was housing. We found that people are generally satisfied with the housing options they have wherever they happen to be living. So we asked these people, what do you want? And uh, here's what they said. I mean, see history down at the bottom, urban living environments a little higher. But man, towering over everything else, 78% of young people told us that when they're considering a place to live, they want to see a great food scene. Um, so that's going to bring us to the most important slide of the night. Here we go, folks. It's only five words. Memorize it. Sear it into your retinas. Here's how you get people to Richmond. Number one, jobs. If you have great jobs, young people will come here and take those jobs. Number two, Though, if you want to get people in the door and introduce them to Richmond and get some Richmond tourists, we found that you're not going to do better than Richmond's food scene. So, because food scene is a pretty vague term, let's find out what it means. Um, we asked people, what do you want in a food scene? And here's what they told us. As you look over this list, I want you to keep in mind, people in D.C., in Charlotte, in Raleigh, they're telling us they don't have these things in their city. They're not satisfied with these options. People in Richmond are telling us, yeah, we've got this. Richmond has this. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the restaurant week concept. Uh, you know, once a year, the restaurants will discount their meals. If any of you have ever been to a restaurant during restaurant week, you know it is slammed. You cannot get a table. People really respond to that. But those things, lots of great restaurants, cheap prices, good variety, we got that every week. And Richmond, every week, is restaurant week. That's something that can, that can bring people in the door into Richmond. Um, if you're in D.C., a young couple in D.C. can take the train down to Richmond, enjoy a great meal, go see the VMFA, and head back to D.C. It's still cheaper than a nice four-star meal up on Capitol Hill. So with that in mind, Andrew's going to take a look at how we can really take advantage of this as a city. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Sorry. So thanks, Michael. Yeah, my name is Andrew Ryan. I'm with Commonwealth Partnerships Group. We do real estate marketing and have an investment fund. I'm going to talk about our recommendations, which is exciting. But first, we wanted to just touch base and reinforce what Michael was saying about how we really think our future is with the food scene and then what we mean by the food scene. Uh, Richmond actually has a pretty good and growing national reputation when it comes to food. Uh, we're featured on national TV shows, on the Food Network and the Travel Channel. We have restaurants and chefs that get national awards. In fact, a couple months ago, the Washingtonian Magazine talked about a culinary renaissance that's happening here in RVA. And just today, Richmond.com reported that Portico, a restaurant in Goochland, was named one of Open Table's top 100 restaurants for outdoor dining. So we've got the food scene, but as Michael and Patrice said, we've got to talk about it. But what do we mean by the food scene? The food scene's more, about, more than just restaurants. It's about creating shared experiences. It's gathering places, bringing people together. It's restaurants, it's breweries, it's wineries, it's food festivals, it's food truck courts, it's community gardens. As we'll hear in the next presentation, young professionals in the millennial generation really strives for connections and creating community and culture amongst ourselves. The food scene is the perfect place to do that, and that's what helps bring us together. So with that, we have three recommendations that we think could work really well and we're excited about. 
The first is an RVA restaurant website, essentially just a centralized location that has information about restaurants, including maps, uh, menus, interviews with chefs, specials that are there. It has a year-long calendar for food festivals that people can plan around and come to the city. It's really just a centralized, independent location, a one-stop shop. The second example brings in more of a governmental angle to it. It's a food tourism campaign. Why not have local jurisdictions, economic development authorities, have their tourism offices get together and go after young professionals in a 250-mile radius, promote Richmond as a food tourism destination, get these people into town so they can see how great our region is and what we have to offer. Food's a way to get to them. Don't forget the statistic from Michael. 80% of young professionals uh, have a great food scene as one of the top things that they're looking for in a city. Finally, something that we're probably most excited about is this idea of an RVA food fest. Think folk festival for the food scene, which is tough to say three times fast, but we think could work really well. It could be a signature event that puts Richmond on the map. Look at food from farm to table. Have chefs competing with one another. Have a charity component. Bring thousands of people to downtown Richmond, to Browns Island, to the convention center, and talk about Richmond as a food destination, because that's what's going to get people into town. Ultimately, we think that we can leverage our food scene, which creates a sense of community. It creates a place for shared experiences. That's going to attract young professionals here, because if nothing else, in RVA, every week really is restaurant week. And so now we're going to hand it over to the final group to talk about what young professionals here in Richmond think about the city. All right, hi everyone, I'm Lauren Sharp, and I am from Memphis, Tennessee originally. Um, yeah? <laughs> we'll talk later, we'll talk later. I had some barbecue today, it was good. Um, and let's see, I went to the University of Richmond, and now I work at Unbox Technology. We are an interactive digital agency. Thank you, Lauren, and Lauren will be back to join us in a moment. Um, my name is Heather Harsh, and I'm originally from the Virginia Beach area. I also went to the University of Richmond, um, and I work at Elephant Auto Insurance, and I'm the website coordinator. So to start out with, hi, I'm Heather Harsh. I'm a young professional. So here we go. We're going to take you through what we found out about young professionals in Richmond. We're going to fly through these pretty quickly to get to the good stuff, but you see a little bit more female, pretty evenly skewed between marital status, a good representation across where people live in the city and the representation of the industries that are here in Richmond. Really quickly on this side, I wanted to point out, um, this really supports what Colden was talking about. 42% of the young professionals in Richmond moved here with no previous ties. So they're not college students, even though we have several big, great universities with a lot of diverse people coming out of them. Um, they didn't grow up here. They came here without any other ties. So I think that's something really important to keep in mind. All right, the theme of our story, Richmond really is, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> sorry, Richmond really is for lovers. So when we asked our respondents, 79% um, said that they're optimistic about the future here in RVA. 78% would move here again if they had to do it all over. And 79% love it here. When compared to our peer cities, only Austin and Denver love their cities more at 86 and 82 percent. So we're in some pretty great company. So why do people feel that way? Um, we didn't really find anything too different from what the other two groups already shared with you. So when people are looking at a city based on its attractiveness, the top things that drive them to that city are good food scene, jobs, uh, quality affordable housing, um, outdoor recreation activities, and safe neighborhoods. So that's just the beginning of the story. The real interesting part came when we decided to take our stats and compare it to a regression analysis of what drives an overall satisfaction with the city in general. We knew this would help us identify the difference between why someone decides to live here in the first place and the important part, what makes them want to stay here long term. So quickly, a regression analysis compares an overall measure, which in our case was well, how do people feel about RVA, to um, specific performance variables. Here, those were what drives an overall positive satisfaction with the city among our respondents, and then we compare that to our peer cities. So when you look at what RVA respondents said made them most satisfied with the city, they said, number one, great food scene, we like to eat, 
An urban living environment embraces creativity, embraces innovation, and is safe. Richmond was the only city that had that ranking and that combination, which I think really points to how unique our population is. Um, so now we've, decide, we've talked about you know, what people look for when they are thinking about moving to a city, and also the top five things that satisfy them enough to want to live there for the long haul. So there's one other thing that really connected a lot of the dots for us. When asked what best describes you when deciding on where to live in general, either job first, location first, or people first, our respondent said people first. Denver was the only other city that said that. So now when we start to look at all these responses combined, a really unique story begins to emerge when you start to think about what attracts and retains my generation, our generation. Um, it's not about the history or about our culture or even our craft beer. It's about the community. So Lauren, how do we know that's true? Actually, I have my own mic. All right, so what really points to this story about community? Well, let's go through a couple things. First, we've taken the plunge. We're invested. 52% of our respondents have bought a home here in Richmond. And we're huge fans of the city. Our net promoter score is 21%. That's only behind Austin at 42% and Denver at 28%. So we're intentionally you know, investing in our community and we're promoting it. Next, we saw this sense of ownership, pride, and purpose among our respondents. 80% have volunteered since living in Richmond and 80% believe they can make a difference. That feeling wouldn't exist without community. Let's talk about this food scene. That really points to the fact that we value genuine fellowship. Think about when you go out to eat. You don't go out to eat with strangers. And if you do, it's with the intent to get to know them better. Meals are where ideas are shared, where relationships are built. And remember that our respondents prioritize this over individual artistic and outdoor recreational pursuits. Now, let's think about the creativity and the innovation, that theme that's been running throughout um, our presentations tonight and what's happening in our city right now. Um, that really points to the fact that our respondents want to influence and shape and own the future of the city through the communities where we work, live, and play. In fact, in his new book, Creative Intelligence, uh, Bruce Nussbaum has pointed out that it's largely social conditions that lead to creativity. And what makes up a great creative team is trust, familiarity between members, and a shared commitment to a common goal. And we're seeing that start to happen here in Richmond. At TEDx, the theme of create, that wasn't about individual artistic creative pursuits. That was about collective, collaborative, community building creation for the common good of the city. So why is this important? Why is this narrative about community important? Um, well, nationwide, our social capital is at risk, and that's been a big topic of discussion for some time. Um, our generation is incredibly connected, but we're lonely. Um, we need to all feel heard and understood. Um, and what makes community so attractive to us is the fact that it's somewhere where you can picture yourself thriving long term, past college, past your first job, into um, you know, starting a family, um, building a career here, investing in your community, buying that home. So if community exists, both freedom and security may exist as well. And that sense of connectedness and formation of social networks comprises what's known as social capital. So social capital, what's really going to move the needle for Richmond's future is the result of thriving communities. So what can we do to really you know, fuel this social capital and attract and retain these young professionals who are so important to it. Well, we need to create the conditions for community to flourish. And we can do that three ways. Um, you've heard a lot of recommendations tonight. Some of ours overlap a little bit, but we believe that you can embrace innovation, rethink job opportunities, and improve safety. First, innovation. Innovation doesn't necessarily mean investing a ton of money into R&D. Sometimes it's just having a conversation with the right people in the right time. 
um, you know, creative intelligence is social. We actually can build our creative ability when we are sharing and collaborating with each other. So we recommend an innovation convocation where you have representatives from the Da Vinci School, um, the Chamber and IE, New Richmond Ventures, City Hall, get them together and invite a panel of young professionals um, from diverse backgrounds, and then invite other members of companies to sit on this panel as well. Share ideas, discuss issues and trends. That way innovation isn't happening in a silo and you're getting diverse multi-generational input. Our next recommendation had to do with rethinking and promoting a variety of employment opportunities. And in the interest of time, I will say that our recommendation for this was largely similar to that of the college crowd. So I'm going to keep moving and talk about safety. That actually hasn't come up yet in the other groups. Um, actually, safety and the perception of safety can be improved through community. Studies have shown that blocks with a strong sense of community had significantly less fear of crime than those without. So as a company owner, as somebody employed here in Richmond, what can you do to improve safety? Well, you can start by creating neighborhood connections. If somebody moves to Richmond, graduates here, moves into a neighborhood, connect them with people from your company who live in that neighborhood. You can have volunteer block parties. VCU did this with Paint the Town Green. That's when uh, a company partners with people in specific neighborhoods to help clean up or tackle a project that the community needs together. But what we really want you to take away tonight from our presentation is that this story um, and what's so important for us is that we, we aren't concerned with being the next it city. A lot of cities can have art walks and food trucks. Um, what's so important about Richmond and our young professionals is this desire and this value that we place on healthy community. So what's really going to attract and retain young professionals and help Richmond thrive far into the future is if we just promote and advocate and rally around this cry for community for the common good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it's time for the fun part. Let's take this out into the audience. Um, Mr. Silvestri's got a microphone. I've got a microphone. Raise your hand. We'll come to you. Um, we do ask that you keep your comments somewhat brief so that everybody gets a turn. Um, I'm seeing a lot of good conversation already. So. Um, Who's going to get us started tonight? Well, why oh, also, oh. Why don't we also bring the oh, that, yes. Uh, we have these chairs. We should put them in it. Thanks for calling, Mister. <laughs> <laughs> One more, John. Before before we go on, introduce yourself because you didn't get too early. Uh, I'm John O'Day with uh, Strategic Staffing Solutions, and I moved here from D.C. about a year and a half ago. Love Richmond. Oh. Well, my, Michael, I have. A, let me have. A, let me tee up the question while the audience feels compelled to jump in here, but. Let me just ask this question in, in, in for the audience over here, for our uh, young professionals behind the study. What makes your generation's recommendations any different than if we put different generations looking at Richmond? What, what's the distinction that, that this study holds? And why is it different? And that was not editorial comment by me, by the way. <laughs> Anybody want to tackle that? Why is, what, is, what, what makes your generation's recommendations different? Excuse me. Uh, well, we yeah. try to trick everybody up over yeah. here. Let's turn it on. Blue mic, Matt. Oh. I think it's working. Wow, that was loud. Um, well, I think Rachel said it in the beginning, which is I know um, Venture Richmond did a study six or seven years ago about kind of the next generation of Richmond, but this is, I think, the first study I'm aware of, at least, that was conducted primarily by young professionals, that we were the ones that designed the question, went out, analyzed kind of what the results were, and I think that that makes it kind of a unique, it's really coming from our generation and, and, and our voice, where I think other studies have studied us but haven't necessarily originated with us. Anybody else on that one? Okay. All right, and uh, here's how the drill works at the public square. You uh, stand up, identify yourself, and hand whoever has the mic the green card. If you don't have a green card, don't worry about it. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Blue card works too. Red card, yellow card, master card would work as well. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who took part, participated in calling all this data together and um, it's an interesting point the uh, RVA 
uh, the Grid magazine that just came out, they had an article, I wrote it, it was about um, community, making community. And um, it was something that I thought a lot about, you know, in the sense of Richmond. And so I just wanted to ask this question, not only to those who put together the study, but what is community in this context? Um, in particular, I saw very briefly, but it was a very powerful brief view, the uh, schematics or the, the data on who was studied. It was like 86% 80 white and 7% black. And so my question is, who is, what is community? When we think of community in Richmond, who are we talking about? 25% um, of Richmond is poor. You know, our focus today is talking about how do we attract, you know, people from outside of Richmond to come into Richmond to focus on jobs and the food scene. Well, you know, there's a lot of people in Richmond that are currently unemployed, and there's uh, an entire, I would say, maybe three-fourths of the city that's food insecure, that, you know, that live in food deserts. They don't have access to healthy produce. They don't even have a grocery store within a mile or more of their neighborhoods. So, you know, when we talk about this, this is a really ironic study, you know, that we're talking about Richmond's food scene when there's people in a city that don't have a grocery store within a mile or more and literally, you know, can't afford one even if they, you know, even if there was. So I guess that's my question or comment is when we're talking about studies like this, you know, who are we asking what community is and when we're defining and trying to make decisions for the city, what are we just asking the couple of folks that are, you know, in our circle what community is and what about those people that are marginalized and don't, you know, get an opportunity to speak? Didn't catch the identity. Uh, my name is Deron Chavis. I work for Department of Social Services, handing out food stamps every day, and I'm also um, uh, one of the finalists for IE with RV, RVA Farms right. to start urban farms in the city. Excellent. Okay. Let's we'll see you again. I have a question. Sure. You go. Go ahead. Sure. So. I was, I hated that we had to run through that slide because we were on a time constraint, but that's something I'm glad that you asked about. Um, we were disappointed when we got the demographic information back from our survey that there was such a huge difference. Um, the point of the survey was to reach out to diverse people, diverse groups. Um, it, it went through social media. We reached out to um, various colleges from, you know, Hampton University all the way up to UVA and in between there. And unfortunately, we saw a lack of response from other ethnicities. So what we took away from that was either one, we didn't approach it the right way and we missed something, um, or two, is there this gap with uh, young professionals and the diverse makeup of what a young professional in, is in Richmond overall? So what we took away from that one is really great. Um, I cannot remember his name, but in some of our presentations, Pardon? Ken Johnson has uh, offered up the funding for us to do a study that really is zeroing in on those more diverse populations. Um, so we get those numbers up and see how it impacts our study because we certainly don't want to do something that is only looking at a small fraction. Um, so we did the study for free. So this is what we came up with on social media. So we're excited to really get in there and see more diverse things. And one thing I do want to add is that like you are in IE and trying to do things like that, we do have a lot of people that are trying to tackle those issues. I think what makes our um, survey and our information unique is that we bring something different to the table. You know, transportation has been a big issue for Richmond for a long time, and that's always gonna be an issue. Education's gonna be an issue. Uh, economic diversity is gonna be an issue. And so we are just, we're kind of presenting another side to it something that's a little bit um, different that gives an added bonus to what already has been going on and will be going on with, with Richmond. Allow me to say that. Sure. My name is John Belechek. I'm a city resident and I uh, live in Oregon Hill and I work downtown and I think it's very important to underscore the importance of transportation. Young people do not want to drive to work. I ride my bike to work. I love it. I wouldn't want to take a job where I have to drive. And so um, making Richmond more transit friendly, walk friendly, and bike friendly is extremely important. And, and to not really take the low hanging fruit, like really put some serious investment into these modes. Um, additionally, a comment for the employers in the region, 
locate downtown. Um, young people want to want to work downtown. They want to work in a community. Um, you know, West Creek is not exciting to me and many of my peers. So, um, what, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> Who do I give the microphone okay, to? Thank you very much. Any comment on that and, and what he brought up? Okay, you're on. Well, you're I'll, on. I'll do something really quickly. Um, okay. I, from the data, we didn't really talk about it, but. Um, Ratings of bikeability and walkability among people who lived in Richmond was rated really low. Uh, and so that's definitely something that we know that people really want, and that is um, there's a gap there. Um, what was interesting is that it's not a driver of overall satisfaction. So, you know, when we look at, when we're trying to tease out what's the most important, um, that's really what we focused on. But it's not something that's getting lost. Um, and as researchers, we're talking about it all the time with, with local um, people in the community about how to improve bikeability. But that's definitely something we see in a lot of our trends research as well. I love exposed brick in downtown as well. Um, however, I do work for a small startup company and we are unable to afford the high cost of working downtown. So I get, I get what you're saying, but I also think that there's an economic component involved that has unfortunately, um, for a lot of startup businesses, um, forced them to locate elsewhere, um, but the boulders are cool, and we have foosball. Okay, all right, question in the back. Hi, I'm Katie Hurst. Um, who maybe don't necessarily want to bike to work, but don't have transportation around the city, like at night, or happy hours, or can't find a cab, or um, I guess just basic transporta transportation around the city, but maybe not necessarily wanting to bike yourself. We just asked about overall bikeability and walkability. We didn't get into actual particulars as to what that actually means, um, just because we can't ask about everything um, in the survey. So that's a great question, um, but unfortunately we didn't go that in depth on that topic. One more question over here. Local DJ and a, I'm also developing a local tourism consulting firm. Um, so, hey, why didn't y'all call me? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I have, my question is, how do y'all see questioning the idea of how Richmond should develop? Um, I have ideas like Boulevard Retail District, Shaco Entertainment District, and ideas that involve a regulata regulated entertainment district. Like, if, have any of y'all been to Savannah or Kansas City or San Antonio where, you know, a lot of those ideas kind of, you know, S Savannah has a historic district. Kansas City has the Power and Light District, which is kind of what Shaco Bottom could be, or the River Walk in Kansas, San Antonio. We have the Canal Walk that could be developed that way. So how would y'all approach the idea of um, seeing Richmond develop for young professionals? All right. Um, I really like a lot of the the areas where you've mentioned, I actually have not been to San Antonio or Kansas City, but um, I have been to Charleston, I have been to Charlotte, I have been to Austin, and I think, to your point, I think developing in communities is really important. I think that what we saw in our study that surprised me a little bit was that our young professionals were living throughout the city and in suburban areas, so there wasn't a huge concentration in city central like I thought that there would be. So I think that kind of shows that we have these unique neighborhoods to start with. Um, and I think if you're creating jobs, then things to support people with disposable income, I mean, demand goes up. So um, as we create conditions for community to flourish, you're going to have um, ample opportunities to develop and hopefully revive areas that have been um, neglected or forgotten. And something else, too, it's, uh, I do a bunch of research in the real estate industry. I think you're right that our generation's a little bit different, and that's why you're seeing this boom in mixed-use developments that are happening downtown and elsewhere, that kind of live-work-play mentality. And I think that goes back to the deeper issue of community, that people want to be near each other. They want to be connected. So I think you're right that that's definitely a trend in, in our generation that's happening. Okay, got a question over here. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Joe Schilling. Um, along with Rachel, I was one of the fortunate millennials that got to go on the, the Chambers trip to Denver. And I guess uh, one of the things that kind of struck us was um, through regional collaboration and some of the things that they did with establishing their mass transit and their, their cultural district. Their cultural district, um, you know, they were, they were able to attract millennials. 
So I guess how do you propose that we really tactically get buy-in from, you know, for better or for worse, the boomer generation here in Richmond in trying to bring about some of these changes that are going to help attract young professionals and get them to stay? Great question. Well, I think uh, one of the, the first steps is to create awareness. And, uh, you know, I was really encouraged, as was the rest of the team, on all the press that this has gotten. So I think that, you know, getting the word out that this is, you know, some of the things that the millennials are looking for and making this a hot topic in Richmond is, um, you know, is definitely something that's important for us. Um, as Lauren mentioned, young professionals are not just in the city, they're also in the communities. So hopefully as this generation continues to grow and become more involved, that will help some of that regional uh, buy-in as well. I think something important too is our, our attitude. I think our millennial has a, our, the millennial generation has a reputation and we've earned it in a lot of respects. So I think buy-in from our elders is going to come from humility and listening and being open to their suggestions as well because there's a level of experience that has gone before us. So yes, we have a lot of new ideas, but I think we approach things with a level of respect as well. That isn't the most politically correct answer of the night. <laughs> Give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Before, we jump in, before we jump into the next question, feel free to just make a statement as well. You don't have to word it in the form of a question. I don't think they need any encouragement, Michael. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sam Davies, city resident, father of two high. small girls. So don't I like the food scene just well, but I think, as you all alluded to, community is a holistic approach. Um, the word school did not appear in a, your executive summary. The word family appeared once. I have, I'm a remote employee for a company that's not in Richmond. What does your data show will keep me here when it's time for my girls to go to middle school? We don't really have an answer for that. Um, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great question um, and something that we actually did in some uh, rooms. We did talk about that issue and how we didn't really delve into that. But what's really interesting is that the, the median age of our audience was um, 31. And uh, over half were, or about half were married. Um, and I don't know that we actually have the data on if they had kids or not. But we have to at least assume that some of those people have kids. So we are getting perspectives among people who do have families. Um, but that's definitely an issue, and I've actually read some articles. There was a great article, um, I forget in which publication, about Philadelphia and about how a lot of the Gen Xers are starting to have families and are grappling with that decision. Do they stay in the city or do they move um, out into the suburbs, but they don't want to leave the environment and the community that they have there um, and trying to, to grapple with that, and the city is as well. So I think that that's definitely an important issue. Um, if, if I if I can build on that real quick, we intentionally used the wording RVA because we're not just studying Richmond City tonight, and certainly, obviously, families do move out to the counties. We were studying how to get people into the metro region as opposed to Richmond City itself, I guess, is a, a qualifier on that. Got one over here. Hi, I'm, I'm Caitlin Kilcoin, and I work for the Greater Richmond Chamber. I manage two of the young professional programs here, uh, Why Richmond and Hype. Uh, my job at the Chamber with Hype is to attract and retain the young talent that's here. And we at the Chamber were actually fortunate enough to get an early preview of the YRVA study. And I just want to applaud you guys, uh, SIR and the volunteer team, for working so hard at um, designing, distributing, and analyzing these results because the Chamber is really thrilled to really back you guys on these actionable takeaways. We want the hype team, which if you guys would stand up, the leadership crew here, hype, hype, stand up, jump up. We want these guys to partner with you guys on how to work on attracting and retaining young talent here. And Hype really wants to kind of be along with the IE initiative on really branding the city as what you guys were talking about, like the RVA food movement that's happening. There are so many great festivals and so many people who are passionate about growing the Richmond food scene and putting Richmond on the map as a food mecca that we want to use, you know, IE, which has done such a great job of branding up and down kind of the East Coast as Richmond as a city for creativity and innovation. 
So we really want to partner with you guys on figuring out how to do that and partnering with, you know, Carrie Pfeiffer, I think I saw her from Richmond.com. I mean, they're talking about a bacon festival that's happening, a bacon festival. Like we can make this big and exciting. And so we, yes, we are here to support you guys, to work with you guys and anyone else who's interested in coming to the table to make Richmond a food place and not only just a food place, but really to attract YPs and, you know, everybody else out there who's interested in visiting Richmond. And I'll be damned, when we do this survey again, we are going to be Austin. We are going to have more swag. And the Chamber and IE and all these, you know, all these programs that are here in Richmond, we're going to be front and center. So I'm excited to see what the next survey comes with. So thank you, Rachel, and thank you guys. Okay, thank you that was, a, that was a paid political announcement from the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> she approves it. We're going to take one more because we want to make sure our employers have a chance to get up there. But we will have more Q&A time after they're done, so don't worry. Hey there. Uh, Alexis Rogers graduated from VCU a week ago. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, I also recently accepted a job at CRT Tanaka, so I am the young professional pretty much that you're talking about that wants to stay in Richmond. Um, I'm curious, though, if... Any research that you pointed to or that you looked at said that, you know, students or Richmond natives don't want to stay in Richmond because they're just ready to go somewhere else. Uh, you know, do we live in a society that says we're globally focused, get out there, go try somewhere new, um, don't stay at home? And, and how do we kind of work with that to keep people here anyway? You know, that's a... Uh, you know, that's a really great point, you know, because, I mean, it's it's not as if, you know, the idea of going and spreading your wings somewhere else is anything that we're, we're, we're not going to want to support, you know, especially from the great universities around here. We're going to want people to spread out in our country and, and, and to try new places. I guess kind of the perspective that we were kind of looking at it with is that we want to showcase that these kind of huge buzzword cities, Austin, Seattle, New York, we want to sort of showcase that Richmond actually has quite similar resources to those things. Uh, you know, traditionally we don't like to think, we kind of have this sort of uh, pessimistic poly type attitude where we uh, don't like to think that we have all these incredible things when we really do. And so I don't think it's really a matter of trying to prevent people from leaving, but rather showing them the reasons why they can and should stay, if that makes sense. Okay, by Twitter. But the question is burning, I, and I and I card, so she put it on a card to make it official. <laughs> so, uh, are there any civic leaders in the audience to hear this feedback? Okay, any civic leaders? Okay, Jay, I'm going to put you on a spot. What's it? Well, come on, you represent all the civic leaders, and God bless you for showing up tonight. <laughs> but I mean, you heard the urban. You're the county administrator in Chesterfield. Any reaction to that? The notion of it's an urban setting they want. Well, first of all, I want to echo the comments from the chamber about thanking you all for the great job that you did. I think, and Tom, I want to thank you too, and the Times Dispatch for sponsoring Public Square on this issue because I think it is absolutely critical to Richmond's future success. The dilemma that I think Richmond is facing was expressed very clearly to me uh, by a friend who manages a very large engineering firm uh, here out of Richmond who said to me, I can't get an engineer under the age of 30 to move to Richmond at any price, but I've got guys a little bit older than 30 who I'd love to have take over my office in Denver and they won't leave Richmond. So, when you get here, particularly, and I think it goes back, I, I did clarify with him, are the ones who won't leave single or do they have kids in the school system? And the answer is the ones who won't leave are the ones who have kids in the school system. So we have a great thing going in Richmond for families. This has for many, many years been a family-oriented community. We have great schools and, and a very high quality of life, but we have missed the boat on learning how to attract the next generation of leaders. The other thing that, so I, I, this is very timely and very appropriate because if we're gonna continue to attract the Sabras and the Amazons and all to the Richmond area. Well, and it all, coincidentally, all happen to be in Chesterfield. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this a, well, that's a paid political announcement too. So 
we, we have to figure out how we're going to preserve the outstanding quality of life for families that we already have and attract more young people to come here. And very timely topic, uh, great research. It's opened a lot of eyes. Now, the question about how do we get the baby boomers to listen more to this, and I'm disappointed that I'm the only uh, leader of my type here tonight, but more of them should be here and should be uh, listening to this. Some of us are very interested in moving young people into more responsible positions in our organizations because we realize, uh, if nothing else, we don't have much time left and we need you all, <laughs> we need you all to fix the problems that we're going to leave behind. And I think more, employee, more, more employers are recognizing that. And I would encourage you as young people, I, you know, I'd love to hear more about really when you meet with an, a prospective employer what you're looking for. But if you came to Chesterfield County and you talked with me, one of the things I would tell you is that I am very interested in getting young professionals on key teams that are working on defining what the quality of life is going to be in RVA 15 and 20 years from now. And we, more employers need to do that, engage you, give you the opportunity to spread your wings, and show what you can bring to the table to help define the future of the region. Thank you, Jay. Jay Stegmaier, County Administrator of Chesterfield, who now has a new ag adjective, unique, for showing up tonight, but actually Jacob Geiger, who is our, our editor and director of Work at Richmond, our uh, small business solution, it's a great segue into the, in the final part where we have employers who've sat here for more than an hour and heard the recommendations. They've heard the survey results and they've heard the back and forth between the audience um, and those who shape the survey recommendations. The third part is to get the employer's initial, initial reaction, the raw reaction. So take it from here, Jacob. One thing I'm going to start by saying is uh, in response to what Joe Schilling just said and Sam, and uh, it's, a, it's something to, to say to Jay and to Andreas Addison from the city who's sitting right there, uh, is that if, if the region does not deliver good schools and pave its roads and cooperate, uh, it doesn't matter how many bike races there are and how many cool companies there are because the cool companies will pack up and leave or the employees will leave and they will go to cities that can execute on that. So it's a reminder to city and civic leaders that you still have to execute on the basic parts of your jobs. Good schools, mow the grass at the schools, um, pave the roads, and otherwise the good companies we have here won't stay and the young workers won't stay. Hey, Jake, if you... Okay. Good. So now I get to introduce no, my panel. No, I'm just doing a boomer thing. You're supposed to be the moderator, not the commentator. <laughs> you lost that control when you gave me the microphone. I know. <laughs> Closest to me is Scott Blackwell. He's the chief culture officer at Health Diagnostic Laboratory. You've been around Richmond for a while, Scott, because you were at uh, Williams Mullen before this and also Land America and CarMax. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And in the middle, we've got Joel Erb. He's someone who's been around Richmond for a while. He is the president of INM United. That's an interactive marketing and advertising agency. And he started it when he was a teenager. So it's already a 14 or 15-year-old business now at this point, even though uh, that makes it only slightly old or slightly younger than Joel himself. And on the far side is Ron Carey, who's the director of human resources and a senior vice president at the Martin Agency. And before that, we had the good fortune to have him working here at the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Uh, Ron, you've also worked at Wyeth and several other places in town, is that right? So we're going to dive right in, and all three of these folks are in a position where they handle hiring, they handle recruitment, they handle management of the talent they have. And so one of the things we saw from the survey guys is there was a real emphasis on jobs and job descriptions that focus on the ability to make something or create something or create content. And so it got me wondering, when you are recruiting this millennial generation, do you use a different style or emphasis of recruiting than when you're recruiting, say, a Gen Xer or a Boomer to come into your organization? I, I mean, I can go ahead and jump in and start on that. I don't know that the, uh, the technique is really different. I think for us, it's, it's interesting because we're in a, a content creation business. Um, for those of you that don't know, we do advertising. We created the Gecko, the Geico character. Uh, but it really is the, the draw for us and for those that we talk to is 
they're interested in coming and doing the best work of their lives and creating something that they might not be able to create someplace else. And so that's the allure of, I think, joining us. And I would echo that uh, for us, we have to really tap into what is it that uh, the millennial generation, which makes up our, our workforce, uh, what do they really want? And I, I'll just read uh, really quickly, directly from um, our job description, uh, how we've worded it. You've probably seen hundreds of job postings by this point. More than likely, you're trying to find a place that has the perfect mix of fun, challenge, impact, and pay. Here at INM, we craft engaging digital experiences and products that awaken our consciousness and contribute towards a better tomorrow. As a firm with 15 years of history, we've worked on projects with Fortune 100s to startups and help them discover solutions that dramatically change the way they do business. We measure the success of our projects by the impact they have on our clients and those who they impact. And we're really honing in on the fact that uh, millennials really want to have meaningful work. They want to do work that they can see the fruit of their, of their labor. And in many instances, uh, for us, we're sh dramatically shifting the focus of the company to being one that is focusing on helping others, working with organizations that are building a better tomorrow. Um, and that's been a mission that resonated and actually was created by our company, by the staff itself. Yeah, I, I don't know that we have a specific strategy for attracting younger people. It happens somewhat by default. Um, one thing that's very important to millennials is doing good and serving the community. And our mission is to save lives. It's very simple. That's what we do at HDL every day. So our mission really connects with people who are generally younger. If, if you're there, you're doing something that's very focused on saving a life um, versus pushing paper around. And it sort of bears out in our demographics. Our, between the ages of 20 and 24 is 15 percent of our population, which is incredibly young. But uh, at, under the age of 29 is a little over 40 percent. And um, if you take a look at our, the management in our laboratories, our technologists, our lead technologists, there are 19 of them, and 14 of those people are under the age of 30, and the average age is 28. So um, again, there's no specific strategy, but I think because of the nature of what we do, it does attract um, younger folks. One of the interesting things that came out of the debate at Yahoo and other companies about telecommuting and flexible work arrangements, I thought m earlier this year, was that it's, it's really not an issue that breaks down on generational or gender lines. Almost all employees, men, women, boomers, millennials, say they have valuable, flexible work arrangements. Are there things you all have specifically pushed or adopted because your workers, whether they're millennials or, or other ages, are s saying, this would improve my job satisfaction and make me more likely to stay? Yeah, I think what's been interesting for us is um, it's a team-based concept, and so <clears throat> it's not that we've driven specific uh, deliverables about how do you create more flexible work environment, less flexible. The team needs to decide that, and so it doesn't need to be a, a company or an organization-driven philosophy around that. We believe kind of that we'll give you the framework to operate, and then your team needs to decide how are you going to get that work done. Some of that work might, might not be done inside of the confines of the building. Some of that work may need to be done in different cities, different venues, different hours, but we want to give you the flexibility to find what works for your team. And for us, um, I, I resisted it for a period of time, but uh, now we've allowed people to work remotely. If they need to, they can work from home. Um, we've put in place, we've eliminated vacation days to the point where there's unlimited vacation days. Um, there is no set limit on that. Um, we have fresh produce brought in every week from local farms that the staff can cook in, their kitchen, in the office kitchen. So we're, we're creating a culture that um, is the life that we actually want to live um, and not have the confines of going to work be um, the way they have been for, for years and years, but really turn it on its head and follow almost a Google approach. Um, and it, it seems to work extremely well because you, you force teamwork you force uh, community internally, where it's not just about the work that you do, uh, but the relationships you're building within that work environment that build a really solid team. Um, due to our growth, we, we now are open 24 hours a day, so the flexibility of work 
is ample. You can work almost any time you want to. Um, you know, insofar as, as telecommuting or, or working at home, um, a lot of our positions require people to be there because they're using laboratory equipment. But on, on the staff side, we do allow that flexibility. And somewhat to like what Joseph, um, excuse me, Joel just said, is we've gone out of our way to create an office that's much like a community where you can exercise, where your dry cleaning can be taken away, where you can eat healthy food, where you can wear what you want to wear, all, all those barriers that sort of get in the way um, of, of structure and schedule. We work very hard at, at taking those out of, out of the, the noise factor for people. So maybe things like you've got to be here at 9 o'clock aren't, aren't so, is, uh, so overbearing on their life. It, Jacob, if I, I mean, if I could just hook on that. What's interesting is um, I've worked in a lot of different traditional businesses and corporations, and each corporation has a different policy for a different reason. I think what I've found to be interesting is right, we don't dictate to you, well, you're going to use a Dell computer versus a Mac computer. You're going to use an iPhone. Right, so you get there, and really what we try and do is decide, what are the tools that you need to be happy? What's, what's going to make you successful? And then our IT and infrastructure that support, it's their responsibility to figure out how to support and make sure that those things work. But you get the tools that you're going to be happy about, pleased about. And so if, if getting a PC isn't the right thing for you and working on a Mac is going to make you happier, it doesn't cost us that much more. But that's one of the things we have found to be important to people. Audience, go ahead and get some questions ready because I'm going to come to you. Question that I have: We heard that uh, college students love it here, but college students don't. Um, just real briefly, do you all tend to hire a lot of local college grads, and are there specific ways you let those college, um, those students who are approaching graduation, know what's available at your company? We definitely do. Um, uh, the last four hires we've had at the company have been directly out of. Uh, colleges from both uh, VCU and U of R. Um, two of those people started as interns with the company. Um, so they were able to get exposure while they were in college, uh, one of which worked uh, part-time while he was in college for a year and a half before he graduated and joined full-time. So we're, we're putting ourselves out uh, at job fairs with uh, the schools, um, and we're, we're definitely making an effort to bring local, you know, groups, uh, user groups and things into our office so that we're bringing the community inside so that uh, those that are on the peripheral interested in, in what we do are able to actually come inside and see what it's like. It's really helped our recruiting efforts. Yeah, it's interesting. I think for, for us, we've done probably more hiring from the brand center at VCU. Uh, we don't do as much from on the undergrad, on the, uh, undergrad level. Uh, when we do hire on the undergrad level, it tends to be more on the operational side, but it's interesting. Right, once you kind of create an employer brand, we don't have to do the job fairs as much, that kind of thing. Um, I think the, the type of work that we do generates a, an interest that people, if you're interested in going into advertising, you know some of the projects that we do, and so that kind of generates a buzz on its own. Um, we have a, a great relationship with VCU. They think a lot like we think, so there's kind of a natural progression down Broad Street from, from the school to HDL. I, I think a big indicator of of how we treat the schools is our intern program and this year we've got almost 40 interns and they range in age from 16 to about 24 so that's a, a huge investment of, of time and money that we're putting into to the school the theater schools it's interesting I saw a statistic that about half of internships convert into jobs so it's it's interesting to hear the intern power that it has in your companies we'll go ahead and turn it into the uh, audience now and I saw a question right here Hi, my name is Dolores Schiff. Okay. Um, I just had some comments. I'm glad to hear that you guys are ready and willing to help other people. There's plenty to do here. We have a homeless population that needs help. Um, also, as a social worker mentioned, there's inner city people who would love to have mentors. You take them out of the inner city. I'm an inner city girl of New York City. I think you can hear my accent. Um, also, what would be good is... Uh, uh, bigger arts in the park type of thing. You have a lot of festivals, but it costs a lot of money to get in there. If there was something free for artists, and artists can come from anywhere in the city and create wonderful things out of anything that they can find, um, but most of us don't have the money to enter these juried shows. So if there was something that was regular and available, Miami has something like that at Bayside. 
They give a place for the artists free. It's a small area. They go there every weekend, and it works out very well. That would be nice to see. And uh, the divide between the millennial and the baby boomers, there's no difference. We wanted the same things when we were young. Okay. Any reaction from the employers? Um, I would say that uh, for, for us in particular, uh, I'm uh, born and raised in Virginia. Um, I grew up on a farm in uh, Amelia. Um, and for, for us, giving back is a huge thing. Um, we're working with Virginia Department of Health now to uh, donate our labor to try to uh, leverage technology to reduce uh, STI infections in uh, 16 to 25-year-olds um, in low-income areas of the city. Um, and we started a nonprofit called Tech Hatch, where we offer an eight-week free program for inner-city high school students to teach them how to start a startup. And we bring mentors in, we take them on field trips, we pay for everything. Um, all in the effort of, of giving back to those who don't have it. And the most powerful thing that comes out of that experience for us is when our, our team goes out and is able to see that they've lit a spark within someone who it has never lit. It, it, it fuels them for weeks. And when they do it over and over again, I mean, you're helping the community where you live in. And you're not ignoring those who don't look like you or came from where you came from. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, a little bit about my, my personal stories. I, I grew up here in Richmond, um, you know, uh, went to Hermitage High School, went to Boys and Girls Club, as a boys, boys club as a kid. And so we've got a deep involve with, involvement with a number of kind of the not-for-profit organizations here in Richmond. And in fact, when we've even done some of our leadership development, we've actually made that a part of um, of the experience for some of our future leaders in the new organization, which is to go off and spend time with the kids and do the mentoring with them and get involved. Um, on the artistic side, uh, of course, for a lot of our folks who are artists and designers, that's a great creative outlet for them to be able to do and, and participate in some of the art shows. And when we recently had the TED Arts, everyone in the office was excited to get out and go participate in the painting of the wall and all of those activities. So. I, I agree with you. I think it makes lots of sense, and we encourage our employees to get out and do that. Got a question in the back, right? Yeah, and before you start, were you as shocked as I that there was applause for the Bacon Festival? <laughs> uh, sorry. Hi, I'm Shauna. Um, I wanted to follow up on Jacob's second question to you about that uh, work-life balance, flexibility in the workforce, team-driven performance, and people working from home. How do you see that play out in the performance of of your teams or of your employees? I mean, I would imagine there's some people who perform better in a more structured environment, some people who are going to work really well with the team dynamics. I mean, how do you see it in terms of performance? It's a good question considering the controversy that the Yahoo, a high-tech company, created over this. So there's, there's not uniformity on it. It's a great question about different arrangements. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, look, I think um, if, if, when you work in a creative space and you work in a creative business, um, there's a lot to be said for feeding off of the other person. Um, and there's an energy that happens once you're inside of the building and you're into the project. I think for us, it would be, it would, there are certain positions that are much easier for you to work from home and to have that flexible arrangement. But I think when you're in the work, and for us, we often talk about the work. And the work for us is, you know, the production of, of a campaign or brand or an experience that someone's going to have on the web. That experience sometimes can be hard harder to, to accomplish when the two individuals aren't together. And often for us, you'll see a writer and an artist together along with someone in the technology space. But you, you need that chemistry. And so what we're, we're still learning how to do right now in 2013 is we've got an office in New York. It's challenging sometimes for us to have someone in New York and a team here because the chemistry's off. We're, we're trying to still figure that out. I think in our workplace, we, we go out of our way to not be judgmental. And what I mean by that is if somebody cranks it out from 9 to 5, shuts down their computer and walks out at 5, we try not to judge that and compare them to the person who's there until 10 p.m. We realize that everybody contributes at a different pace on a different day. And believe it or not, for a, a scientific laboratory, we're incredibly creative. We, we want people to do odd things and innovative things. We've got people in rooms tearing down machines and putting them back together. Um, and, and doing things that have never been done anywhere in the world. So 
yes, while they've got to be there and face to face to interact with the equipment, and interact with other scientists or lab technicians, we, we kind of throw all the rules out, out the window and, and that works for us. Okay, I got a question over here. Step out so I can hand this to you. There you go. Good evening. My name is Ken Borsing and thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, my question is around uh, bringing in outside talent. Uh, so what are some of the tools you're using and what are some of the resources that you provide or make available to folks and especially prospective candidates as they uh, are either trying to visit your uh, companies on site or at least uh, in, when you're trying to sell them on the Richmond region? Thank you. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting. Yeah, right. We would love to get a lot of our talent um, from this marketplace. Um, but it's amazing when we're talking to folks from Sao Paulo, we're talking to folks from Amsterdam, we bring people literally in from all over the world. And we try and give them, first of all, when you, when you tell someone in Sao Paulo that you're going to come to Richmond, Virginia, um, the phone kind of goes silent on the other end because, first of all, it's where is Richmond, Virginia? Um, and we do the, and if you get here, you're going to fall in love with the place because it's fantastic. Uh, we, we send them information. We use kind of some of the products that come out of the Times Dispatch magazine in terms of the annual um, best places to kind of best places to go and experience. Um, we'll kind of, you know, send them information that we've got on the website in terms of photographs about activities that take place. And often we have to schedule a trip and bring uh, both, the, both spouses along or both partners along so that they can actually come to Richmond and experience it. And once they get here and start to see kind of cost of living, um, the experience done in Shaco, the office, um, all of that, that entire experience, it kind of it feeds on itself. There, there are quite frankly some people that aren't ever going to take up, take up the, take up the um, opportunity to come here and work because it just doesn't appeal to them. But there are plenty that once they do, um, they really they, they get hooked. I saw a question over here a minute ago. Is that... My name is Alex, and uh, it's kind of actually a follow-up. Um, when people do come, do you provide any benefits for actually living in the city or living nearby in the neighborhoods that your uh, offices are located? Um, did, did you mean in the way of, like, you know, to help them get to know the neighborhoods or to help them choose where they live? You know, as an example, is there any interaction that you guys have with Jackson Ward as a place to live for employers who work for you? We haven't had any specific interaction focused on housing, but we do, we're partnered with a lot of organizations throughout Jackson Ward, Art 180, for example. I see Phil Whiteway here from Virginia Rep. So a lot of the arts organizations or education organizations in that area, we're, we're in and out of those organizations. We have giving fairs where these people come in. So we go out of our way and are very intent about people, about exposing people, but um, not anything specific related to housing. Now, what's interesting, what we do is we've uh, revamped how we onboard and bring po folks in, because we realize it's incredibly, it's a social experience. It's great to connect with someone that has a common experience. Um, they might have young children, that kind of thing. So we'll provide um, a, a buddy when you first get in so that you can connect with that individual and hopefully either the employee or their spouse has some common experience with you and then can start to get you out. One of the things we're going to start to do is um, kind of the hook you into some of the restaurants so that we, we the company, pick up the cost of your buddy taking you and your spouse or partner out to different restaurants around town so that you can start to kind of get a feel for community and fit for what, what might be the best thing for you and your family. We're time for one more question. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, and uh, my question, I'm not exactly sure who it's addressed to, but uh, just an observation um, is that I, I felt there's a little bit of preaching to the choir um, happening in this last section in that if I had to name the organizations and the companies who I would expect to have uh, a workforce and a workplace that would cater towards millennials, I would name you three. And so I noticed the absences of Altria, Midwest Vaco, Owens and Minor. Um, what would it take to get them up here? Um, and what could we do about that? Well, actually, Jacob, you need to handle this one because you invited these three up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. What I would say is I know Kellen's back there, aren't you, Kellen? So there's Kellen Ball from Capital One, who's going to be the chair of Hype. 
which is the Chambers Young Professional Organization. And I actually, on Sunday, I had a story that did talk to some people from Capital One about how they recruit. Um, but it's a good point that you have to make sure that everyone from a two-person startup to a 10,000-person employer like Dominion or Capital One uh, is a big draw for the region. Do you all have anything else you want to add now that I've been hung out to dry by my publisher? <laughs> One thing that I would uh, throw out there is that w a tool that we found very helpful for us in understanding um, the way our, you know, each individual is, is a snowflake, for lack of a better word, and you have a ton of those wonderful uh, personality tests that are out there. Um, we uh, work with a lot of companies, and they have this test called Insights, and that has been an incredibly insightful, no pun intended, um, tool for us to understand you know, the communication style of each person um, and really uh, when it comes to interactions and conflict, it's been a, an incredible tool for helping people understand and relate to each other, which has been something that uh, we've seen without forced conversation. The, the millennial segment has, uh, at least we've worked with in the past, it's, it's a difficult thing to open up. I, I think what I would say to your, your, um, your point about kind of some of the larger corporations that are here, I think they've got the same interests that we do because they, they realize the, the skill gaps that they're going to need moving forward. And I think we all have the same challenge, which is around needing um, a diverse set of skills that primarily can bring a way of thinking about technology to your business. Um, the chart, uh, I think, is it Rachel? I think the chart that you had up, that's just, just talking about the job gap, um, one of the things that I'd, I'd ask you guys to think about is what is the role that technology plays on that? Because you can now build a company like Google and get to a market share valuation that far exceeds anything that we've ever seen before and do it with only 100,000 people or 70,000 people, which is almost unheard of. The AT&Ts and the rest when they've done it, right? you've had 300, 400,000 people working for you. And so the marketplace has just changed. And so when we think about bringing talent in, even whether it's local talent or outside, that's what we're looking for is that kind of those next great big ideas, an understanding of the technology experience and how it helps us kind of do something different from clients for clients that we can't do today. Let's give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well done. Thank you, Jake. I'll do the last word about parking. Okay, so Public Square usually lasts 90 minutes. This could last 90 days because it's an important topic. Michael, stand up. Let me put you on the spot. What happens next? Uh, we're all going drinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Any of us who feel the question, that's probably needed. Um, we're going over to pasture. Uh, and actually, Michael, Michael. Oh. Jacob will handle the drinking. <laughs> you answer. I mean, what, hap what has to happen next? Oh. You mean not in the next five minutes, but in the next five years. <laughs> so this is the modern day workplace. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's an important discussion. There were lots of great ideas tonight. There's lots of energy. There was lots of sarcasm tonight, too. The important thing is that we're all going out into the world and doing something about it, really. So let me answer my own question. <laughs> hey, uh, hang on, let me try that again. No, no, you had your chance. This is how, you had your chance. You had your chance. I'll offer a challenge to every employer in the greater Richmond region to engage with this study. I'll offer a challenge to find out what Richmond's future has laid down as an information track about tomorrow's workplace. And I offer this room to any group of CEOs or any group of HR executives to get in a room and share best practices to take the next step about what you're saying. Because one thing that you can do that is different than previous generations, you can, take, you can keep the study off the shelf and on the main road to actions that really uplift our society and our community. You have something else. You have an unbiased about what's happening for us in the future and, an, and, a, and a really a refreshing amount of pride of what this community can be all about. That alone, that idol alone can be the catalyst for the next change. So, thank you for coming. I don't know whether if... Jacob actually does have important information. Okay, we'll, we'll get to Jacob in a minute. <laughs> I just want to thank our audience for coming. I don't know whether a free admission can be a sold out, but we are, thanks to you. But I really appreciate you spending 90 minutes on this important topic. And I hope you do take those words and, and on your own, with your employer or with your colleagues or with your neighborhood, take the next step.